Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, and thank you for joining for our afternoon session. As a reminder, points of view or opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Shelley Solomon, CEO of Justice and Security Strategies and subject matter expert for the Body Wearing Camera PIP TTE program to start off the session entitled Digital Evidence Management. What do we do with all the footage? Shelley? Thank you, Brittany. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for coming to our session on what to do with all that stuff now that you have it. Um, let me first start by introducing our panelists, our uh, Dr. <laughs> Craig Uchida, I'll change it up. Dr. Craig Uchida, who is the president of Justice and Security Strategies. And um, he's worked a lot with the Los Angeles Police Department, as well as just with a lot of departments on body-worn cameras. I am Shelly Solomon. I'm the CEO of Justice and Security Strategies. Um, I have worked in the Broward County area uh, on the digital evidence management and also as the executive project director for the small rural and tribal body worn camera program. And we also have Dr. Char Charles Katz uh, from Arizona State University who's over in Phoenix and has done a lot of work in the Arizona area um, and across the world actually. So we're very excited to have him join us today. Okay, now we'll so um, the focus of this is on digital evidence management and what all that encompasses. Uh, we're gonna go, we did a, a, a lengthy study to, to learn about digital evidence management um, at the request of John Markovic at BJA. And so we're gonna go through some of the products out of that effort where we created an agency matrix when we looked at seven departments and what was the range of video evidence that they had. We're gonna talk about how the videos flow through the police department and out into the world through public release and also to the prosecution and courts. And then we're gonna go through some questions and issues with respect to release. So I hope you're um, excited for a, a fun afternoon of doing this. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Greg now to describe digital evidence management. All right, hi everyone. So. Over the course of these three days, you're going to be hearing a lot about uh, digital evidence, and I and I feel like we need to give you some baseline understanding of what we're we're talking about. And it's pretty straightforward. It, it's really information and data uh, of value to an investigation that's stored in in some kind of way, whether it's on your cell phones or your computers, or uh, whether it's vo video footage whether it's in-car video, other kinds of information are, are part of what we call DEM. And we'll probably refer to it as DEM throughout just to make things easier. One of the things overall is that as, as part of our TA role uh, over the last eight years, we feel like it's important to both answer questions that you have about body-worn cameras but also to look what's coming up, what's going on. And, and one of the things um, that John Markovic did about five years ago was say to us that there's a huge amount of information and video now being accumulated by police agencies, sheriff's offices, et cetera, and that we need to take a look at it and, and see what's going on with all of it. And, and so as part of that, we, we started to ask questions about how, how's, how is footage used in different jurisdictions? How much video are you accumulating over time? And, and what kind of issues and challenges do you face with respect to all of this footage? And, and so we started looking at different agencies. We looked at seven agencies and, and tried to answer some of these questions and we're going to try to give you some answers today, but we'll probably raise more questions with you as well. Chuck, you want to talk a little about, bit about Phoenix and, and what you did there? And Shelly, if you talk about South Florida, that'd be great too. Yeah. Uh, so with, with Phoenix, we spent quite a bit of time. Uh, we spent time since roughly about 2013 with Phoenix working on their body-worn camera program. And along with it, we've seen the growth in digital evidence management. Uh, in way of background, Phoenix is one of the larger local police agencies in the country. I think it's ranked around fifth or sixth large population with about 1.6, 1.7 million people that is uh, ethnically diverse. Uh, it's predominantly Hispanic. About 45% of the city is comprised of Hispanic 
residents, followed by around 42 or so percent uh, Caucasians. And then we have roughly 7-8% uh, of the population is African American. Phoenix Police Department, for those of you that don't know, were what was one of the first agencies in the United States funded by BJA to implement and test body-worn cameras, of which they adopted, I want to say it was somewhere around 50 to 60 body-worn cameras back in 2013, in which we tested them in one precinct. And then after a year after that, they adopted about 60 more cameras. A year after that, 60 more cameras. Until we got to today, where about 2,500 officers in the Phoenix Police Department have body-worn cameras. They're with all the units, both patrol investigations and specialized units. Uh, and they also have a body-worn camera unit that's responsible for implementation. That body-worn camera unit has a few sworn officers, including a sergeant, uh, has a couple of administrative assistants, and then the rest of them are uh, what we call civilian police aides in which they're responsible for uh, some aspects of auditing, uh, redaction, making sure that training is taking place across the police department with anybody who needs a body-worn camera, as well as repairs and anything else that might be needed uh, in the agency. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kelly to talk a little bit about South Florida before we get going. So in South Florida, we looked at two uh, agencies, the Fort Lauderdale Police Department and also the Broward County State Attorney's Office. And the Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale is a, a beautiful city in South Florida. It's a medium-sized city, about 180,000. Um, the It's a majority minority city with about 46% white and then 32% black and 18% Latino. They, the police department has about 530 or more officers and some civilians. The, they adopted their body worn camera program in 2018, but there was a lot of hesitancy uh, on, this, on the city council before they did it, a lot of worry about the expense. So they took their time to really evaluate the cameras. Um, but then did did decide to go with them and went full force in the sense that they they purchased 1100 so every officer has two cameras pretty much or that's a, that's the way they started the program um, the Broward County State Attorney's Office um, is a again a, a Broward County is a large county there's about 500 employees, and they serve a population of about 2 million. But most importantly for this purposes, they work with 16 law enforcement agencies as well as the Broward County State Attorney's Office. So they're ingesting digital evidence from all 16 agencies, including a, a tribal agency. And that makes for some interesting digital evidence management on their part. So, Okay. Um, Chuck, do you want to take this? Yeah, so right here, what I wanted to do was point out the variety in which uh, digital evidence is managed across agencies. Here we have our seven study sites, and what you'll see is they come in a variety of sizes, all the way from the giant of, of Los Angeles Police Department with about 7,000 officers to a smaller uh, agency, or you know, I would call it a mid-size agency of the Glendale Police Department with, with 300 officers. And we, we have a variety in between of, of large and medium-sized agencies. But what we start to see is dramatic differences in the number of videos uh, captured by police officers within the agency, as well as the amount of storage used. And so I just want to go ahead and, and, and if you can think about it in terms of the number of body-worn camera videos that are taken based on the number of officers in that agency. Uh, if you calculated it out on a rate basis, you would see that there's a lot of variety from roughly 60 videos taken per officer in Glendale uh, up to roughly uh, 600 videos per officer in Rochester, right? We have, we have massive differences in the amount of, of number, I should say, in the number of of videos uh, that are that are taken by officers within the police department, which can be which can be the result of a number of different factors that we'll get into here in a little bit. But we also have dramatic differences in the amount of storage that's used, even in agencies that are roughly the same size. So if you take a look at Rochester and, and Fort Lauderdale, they roughly both have uh, about 500 officers with uh, body worn cameras. But if you break it down on a, on a terabyte level, what you see in Fort Lauderdale is that, that they use roughly about a half a terabyte of storage with 535 officers. 
But in, in Rochester, what you'll see is they have about 400 terabytes that are used. It's, it's dramatically different, even though the officers are both, you know, roughly about, you know, 500 to 600 videos per year per officer. So we see 500 to 60, uh, 500 to 600 videos taken per officer in each agency, but um, Rochester uses about 400 times as much space as uh, Fort Lauderdale does, and that has to do with a number of different factors. But th the point is that that there is no one size fits all in terms of the number of videos that are going to be shot by officers, the amount of storage that's going to be used by officers. And agency size is only one factor that will determine uh, the usage or the storage of video, but rather we have a number of other factors that we're going to scoot into here in just a bit that have an impact on, on how much uh, video and storage is used. Chuck, you want to start here and, or I can't? Go ahead. Yeah, well, there, there's a, uh, to sort of get us started here, the, the, the complexity of body-worn camera footage flowing throughout a department is actually pretty complex. And it can take a number of turns depending upon how that agency uses body-worn camera video and what it finds valuable to use. We boiled it down into roughly five easy steps here. If you take a look at the report that Craig has posted in the chat, uh, you'll see a number of different examples by a number of different agencies of how digital evidence moves throughout the police organization in a variety of ways and how often it's used, right? In some agencies, it's used more for some reasons and less for others. But when we're talking about uh, body-worn camera and move, it's, uh, the digital evidence moving throughout the agency, we're obviously starting off with an incident that occurs and that incident needs to be recognized by the police, either through the officer stopping and questioning uh, being called uh, or responding to a call for service. Uh, and then we have a variety of factors that can be related to activation, right? Uh, depending upon the department, activation can be voluntary or it can be mandated. There can be a variety of factors that can influence uh, activation, such as situational factors, officer factors, uh, the types of incidents that an officer is responding to, community level factors, uh, as well as police agency uh, policy uh, that can be responsible for activation and can result in more or less di digital evidence being managed by the police department. So once we have um, body-worn camera uh, that has been activated, typically that that video is going to be categorized and stored based on a number of different number of different factors which can implement, um, storage and, 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 and categorization of the, of the data. Uh, but we typically will categorize it in a number of different ways. One will be based on offense type. That will have an impact on how long the video is stored by the agency. And then we also will have things categorized based on a number of other factors, such as whether or not it was a training event, whether or not it was a critical incident, uh, whether or not it needs to be reviewed by a particular unit, depending upon what occurred. Uh, and then it can also be based on whether or not it is going to be going out to the public due to a public records request. And we'll have a number of different categories and storage options that are available and a number of the different vendors use different mechanisms to allow this uh, to happen. Once that has happened, and that's typically done by the uh, officer that takes the video, but not always. You can have changes that take place by a sergeant who might change things. We have different uh, supervisors that can categorize things differently, as well as in larger agencies, we can see a body-worn camera data moving into the uh, body-worn camera unit of which things might be collapsed, categorized, and stored for a variety of different reasons, depending upon the needs of the, of the agency and how it's going to be used. And that sort of takes us to internal use. Different agencies have different compliance policies, and it will re be reviewed for it. Uh, it might be data might be collected and, and retained for different reasons or for different lengths of time, depending upon what an arrest or an offense was related to, offense severity. Uh, also, whether or not there was a complaint uh, involved or use of force, a critical incident that may have occurred. And then we have data that flows into external use, and that can be done in a variety of different ways in which 
um, uh, is largely determined by the vendor that an agency is, is going through. But we do know that the data is shared with uh, district attorneys, defense attorneys, the courts, and it can be released to the public for a variety of, of purposes. Craig? Yeah, one of the things we we found in our study also, and Shelley will talk about this a bit with Broward County, police departments in transferring the data to for external use have 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 different means, right? I, you can if you've got your cloud based systems, then you're able to share somewhat directly with the DA's office and somewhat directly they can then share with defense attorneys. Uh, but we found also that police departments in, in small rural areas um, have to burn DVDs or, or CDs to provide to the DA office. And, and that kind of uh, process continues. Um, the 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 problems there certainly are resource oriented and time and effort, uh, but it is the, the way things have to be transferred. So, so there's, again, I think the point of all this is to say that there are many, many differences across the country in, in, in terms of how this evidence does flow and, and how it, it is used. One thing I want to mention also is that internally, your agencies are, are looking at video in different ways than, um, at, than in terms of evidence for the courts. You're looking at them for administrative purposes. Uh, you might be looking at them to make sure that officers are complying with your policies. And, and you're also trying to make sure that when you get civilian complaints, that you're going through the video to make sure that the complaint is warranted or not. Um, and, and so there, there are all of these other things that go with uh, the footage. And I, I think it's important for those of you who are starting out to recognize that this is what's going to happen down the line. And the previous matrix also shows how much video you may start to accumulate. And I think planning for that and thinking about all that is extremely important. Shelley? So the issues that we want to dive into are activation and deactivation and how that affects digital evidence. For instance, if in your policy you allow the officers to turn off the video in the middle of a scene to have a discussion, then you end up with two videos or more videos. And there is the issue of once it's in your system, how do you tie those videos back together if you have a public release or you need to give to the prosecutor? And that makes for a real challenge, especially when you're trying to tie the cases together because, because it becomes a one-to-many relationship and, and managing that has presented some challenges for folks. There's also the retention and deletion. Chuck mentioned how you know Rochester has a lot more videos than does Fort Lauderdale. To that end, Fort Lauderdale is really big on the delete button. They have over 100 different categories. And if you're a traffic stop, you're only going to get to hang around as a video for 90 days before you're deleted, you know, unless you have a public request. So they, they use those categories, those, all those categories, very efficiently to figure out what they're going to keep and what they're going to let go of. Critical incidents also have a lot of factors that go into this, and Craig will go into this detail in terms of officer-involved uh, shootings, uses of force, complaints, how are those captured, and how are they stored, and who gets to see them. And then we have the transfer of footage to the prosecutors, and this is what we really looked at in South Florida. You know, they set up the transfer between Fort Lauderdale and and the, the state attorney's office very seamlessly with using their, the products that they used. However, in Fort Lauderdale or in the Broward County Sheriff's Office, some of the departments didn't. And so they were having to ingest the data um, from different, that had different, um, you know, some of them were dot movies, some of them were dot different, different extensions on them. And they had a really hard time getting it where the prosecutors could see all the evidence, especially when multiple scene, multiple agencies went to a scene, it really presented some challenges. And then there's the public release of the footage and, and how, to, how do you redact that? How do you keep up with what you redacted? How do you keep up with the footage so you don't delete it? 
because now you've released it and you want to maintain it. Well, how do you set up those tagging systems? And in the case of Fort Lauderdale as well, and I'll talk about this more, is um, how do you get the public involved in giving you footage? So with that, let me um, shift over to Chuck and he'll talk in detail about activation and deactivation. Yeah, so, you know, I've really enjoyed, uh, it sounds odd, enjoyed uh, sort of understanding the, the issue of, of, in particular, activation, because I think it really is where the rubber uh, meets the road with body-worn cameras, is we learned in the 2013 to about 2016, uh, you can hand body-worn cameras out ad nauseum, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be turned on, and that, uh, that really there's a lot of factors uh, that can have an impact on whether or not uh, an officer activates their, their body-worn camera. When it comes to deactivation, uh, there are some intricacies involved with it, but the, the process has is, is shown itself to be a little bit more simple than what we first thought when body-worn cameras were first rolling out. When body-worn cameras were first rolling out, there was a lot of concern about just basic issues. Were officers going to have to have them on, and were they going to have to remain on the entirety of their shift? Were they allowed to turn them off? And as we've seen the body of work and, and implementation take place around the country, what we have found is that there's some fairly, uh, there's a lot of consistency in policies related to deactivation uh, in terms of when it should be turned off. Um, it should not be turned on under certain situations, the obvious ones in terms of whether or not any personal behavior was taking place of the officer when they're on their own, such as using a bathroom, having conversations with fellow employees, some of the, some of the, now, some of the things that we now consider rather basic. Where we're still trying to understand some of the issues is uh, when officers turn them off in the field. Uh, and there's a lot more discretion uh, surrounding if they should be activated or not. Some things have emerged if we're dealing with uh, children, particularly the victims of abuse, uh, when we're talking about individuals that may not be dressed appropriately and, and timing, uh, you need to turn it off for a bit. But typically agencies are starting to develop policies uh, such as an announcement. Okay, I'm turning off the camera now for X, Y, or Z reason. I will activate it when this situation occurs. But with activation, there's a lot more going on. It, 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 there's much more complexity involved in it due to the amount of discretion uh, that is afforded to officers in a number of different ways. And we know that there are roughly five factors that influence uh, activation of body-worn cameras. Uh, one of them is officer-level factors, right? Things like gender, ethnicity, age, time and service. People have been looking at those issues. Things like situational factors, like what is the type of offense? How was the officer? How did they come into contact with the incident and what generated the incident, right? We also have uh, organizational aspects in terms of squad and, and precinct level factors that may influence body-worn camera activation. Uh, we have recently learned that neighborhood factors influence activation. And then last, uh, we know that policy uh, is related to it. And I want to just go through each one of these uh, uh, fairly briefly. So one of the factors that we know that has by far the, the, the biggest impact on whether or not a body-worn camera is activated is policy. Policy that requires a camera to be activated under certain circumstances means that a body-worn camera is more likely to be activated under certain circumstances. That should, be, should not be a surprise. But what we have begun to learn is that when the policy or, or the policy articulates when it should be activated also has an impact. In Phoenix, for example, what we found was under its old policy, body, uh, officers were required to turn the body-worn camera on when they arrived at the event. What they found was that that was starting to uh, result in a number of complexities. Uh, was that the type of event that the body-worn camera was required to be turned on for. Sometimes they would get to an incident and there was concern for other issues, so they did not have time to turn on the body-worn camera, but there was just a lot more discretion built in. And so Phoenix, over time, moved to a policy that the body-worn camera had to be activated as soon as they received a call for service or as soon as they initiated their uh, decision to address a particular incident in the field, and that had to be turned on 
uh, immediately once they were either call a call for service that they decided to take or were uh, ordered to take or when they decided to make a field contact that had to be turned on. That instantly changed activation rates and improved activation rates from roughly 60 to now about 80 to 90 percent, depending upon what it was. Just a dramatic impact. We also know that situational factors have a profound impact on body-worn camera uh, activation. Self-initiated uh, stop, much less likely to see a body-worn camera activated. We're much more likely to see a body-worn camera activated when it's a property crime, when it's an arrest, when the officer uses force. But we also know that it's less likely to result in being activated when there's a vehicle stop. So it looks as though what we're seeing is when there is a, a proactive proactivity by the officer, they're less likely to activate their camera compared to things uh, where there's some decision making occurring ahead of time. And that might have to do with, with what's taking place and what's going on in the officer's mind uh, in the field. Uh, officer characteristics. We do know that some officers are much more likely to activate their cameras than others. We do appear to have a small number of officers that are fairly resistant. Uh, there was some research by Malm uh, that looked at these issues and found that some officers were just simply not turning on their cameras. But outside of that, we do find that there is a difference between males and females in activating their cameras. For whatever reason, the research has been fairly consistent that females are significantly less likely to activate their cameras than males. Males are much more likely to activate their camera. We, we can speculate as to why, but we don't have confirmation about that. We also know that precinct level leadership matters. A commander, whatever, if you have a lieutenant who's, who's over the, the, the precinct, it can vary. But we do know that that leadership makes a difference and their expectations make a difference. In Phoenix, for example, we found that there was one precinct where officers were significantly less likely. And it appears as if that had to do with how things were being dealt with in the field and expectations among the officers. And then last, we know that neighborhood level factors influence uh, the activation of body-worn cameras. One is in Hispanic communities. Uh, in Phoenix, for example, we found that in Hispanic communities, officers were much less likely to activate their body-worn camera. Uh, conversely, in communities where we have a high population de density or a large number of people living in a relatively small number of people, small uh, area, we see that body-worn cameras are much more likely to be activated. So in a nutshell, there are a number of different factors that can have an impact on whether or not a body-worn camera is being activated. Uh, we think that policy has, has the strongest impact, and that's followed by a situation and officer level, level factors, neighborhood uh, level factors, and, and precinct level factors appear to be somewhat of a small, uh, have a relatively small effect on the decision to activate, but nevertheless are important. Craig? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, note that I put in the chat uh, the paper that you've written about this. Um, I, I think it, I I I particularly like the the study just because it it shows the importance of changing policy uh, to the activation because it affects the activation policy. Clearly, makes a difference there, and I I think turning the cameras on when officers Receive the call for service made an incredible difference in uh, activation rates. I'm not sure that it's appropriate for every agency, but it's seemingly very appropriate for the Phoenix Police Department. And and I think you know it's it's a it's an instance where research has actually shown value, right, Chuck, about uh, about that policy. And, uh, and this is me. This is on retention and deletion. Why are the wh what's the big deal about retention and deletion? Why is this an important issue? Uh, I think what we're finding clearly is that departments are having to store a lot of this video, and the the question becomes: Okay, so which ones do we retain? Which ones do we have to delete if we want to reduce? the numbers within uh, the, in your storage uh, room, in, your, uh, in the cloud, uh, because we're also, we also know that this is one of the cost factors uh, that comes into play for, for you when you're uh, negotiating and trying to get a good deal on 
your cameras. So you, you do need to pay attention to what to do about retaining and deleting. One of the things that um, we've been doing is looking at policies and uh, what are departments across the country doing with retention and deletion. And we've looked at a, over 400 uh, body-worn camera policies from, from both large agencies and, and small agencies to see what they're saying about this issue. And, and overall, I think what, what they're doing is looking at categorization and tagging. And, and this, this is where that topic also plays a very, very strong role that a lot of departments, a lot, uh, I, I want to say uh, about 25, 30% of departments have in their policies the, the different types of categories that you can use when you're, when you're tagging video. And, and those vary also. This, this is unfortunately another problem we have is that departments vary in, in terms of their categories. We, we don't have a way to say, here's the, here's the model for categorization, because there, there are so many. As uh, Dr. Solomon mentioned, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, they have a very, very large number, nearly 100. In other agencies, large agencies and small, they have 20 to 30 categories that officers have to tag and, and their video and hopefully do so and hopefully do so accurately. We found, for instance, in, in Atlanta, they have about 15 categories. In uh, the District of Columbia, the police there have 24 categories. In a smaller agency, Carroll Valley Borough, in, and I believe they're a township in, in Pennsylvania, they have eight categories. Uh, so again, it's going to differ by the size of your agency, perhaps, uh, and also what you define. But the importance here, too, is attached to the category uh, is the amount of time that you should retain that particular type of footage. And, and this is also going to vary by your states, by your lo local laws, perhaps, and even your own department. Uh, a lot of states now are starting to pretty much mandate the retention and, and deletion time periods. Um, so California has a, a policy. Florida has a policy. Other states will, will follow suit. And also your jurisdictions, your city councils may uh, initiate their own type of deletion retention rules. So I, I think what I'm trying to say here is that yeah, you need to follow whatever state you're in, whatever your um, city or, or township you happen to be in, uh, and, and align with those policies. At the same time, if you don't have any, um, if you need some help with that, that's part of the technical assistance you know, that, that all of us at CNA and ASU and JSS can provide in, in terms of giving you policies that have these um, different structures. I, I know that we've accumulated about 50 or so that are, that are pretty broad ranging that we can provide and, and give you some help on that. Um, so, you know, let, let us know. I think at the end of this, we have our contact information uh, available to you and can certainly address those for you. And this is on critical incidents. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you've heard in, in the previous uh, presentation is, you know, what to do about footage with respect to critical incidents. And, and so I don't want to belabor too many things. But I think it's also important that um, you do have a plan for how you release critical incident footage, uh, that it, it's really important in advance for you to, to know and, and to know when and what and how you're going to do it. The, I think those questions are, are really important. What type of footage do you release? And, and do you release all of the footage for a critical incident? It's a lot of footage if, if you have uh, a lot of officers on scene. It, if not, maybe you do want to have uh, a narrative and a, a briefer 
segment that you provide to the community. Uh, but I think you need to decide that in advance and, and set forth different rules that, that you're going to follow to make those things happen. I, I think um, the incident also is, is not just reviewed externally, it's going to be reviewed internally, right? I mean, this is the other point of body-worn camera footage. In LA, they have a force investigations division that uh, not only looks at footage, but looks at the entire incident and, and does a, a very thorough investigation of, a, of an officer-involved shooting or any other defined critical incident. And in doing so, they, they take all of the footage, whether it's from two officers or 20 officers, uh, the department will take all of that footage and comb through it. Uh, again, depending on the size of your agency, it will matter in terms of how much review you're going to do internally. Ideally, you want to do it all, but it also means having the resources available to do that. I, I think that also links back to how you release to the public. Do you have the resources to go through footage, to do redaction, um, to, to look at it and, and know what's what's reasonable and what's not. And that takes time, that takes effort. There are also now uh, rules that govern releasing footage of critical incidents. Um, in, in California, the rule is now within 45 days after that incident. And, and so every police agency in the state of California must release footage about that critical incident within that 45 day time period. Uh, I don't know other states, um, and their rules and laws, uh, but I suspect that many of them are starting to look at that mandating the release. So, uh, you know, it, again, part of it is your ability to plan for it, your ability to understand what should and could be released and, and going from there. And, and lastly here, you know, how does this impact the relationship with the community? It, it impacts community a lot. And I think as you saw in the previous presentation, there are pluses and minuses to how to do it right, how to do it wrong, how to do it inappropriately, how to do it appropriately. And there are a lot of lessons learned out there. And, and talking to your colleagues in other agencies is, is one way. And also looking online at all of the YouTube videos and other things that are out there will also help you. The, there are thousands of YouTube videos now, um, both from police departments and from citizens themselves, and it gives you a relatively good idea of how and in what way people are interpreting the video that's that's available. We got about ten minutes. Okay, Shelley, I think this no, is I'm you. Yeah. So when you think about the public release of video, this was a big issue for Fort Lauderdale. And, and, you know, thinking through what's the process for public release, is there, is it only the chief that's making the decision? How are, how is the department and the prosecutor's offices uh, working together on the release of video? And what is the time frame for those releases? What role do city, city officials or county officials have in the release of that video? Um, and how is that going to work? And then also the types of videos that are released. I mean, critical incidents aren't the only videos that are requested for public release. And so who gets to make those decisions on those traffic stops and how those are released? So there's just different different levels to think through in a matrix of that release. But when you think about it, you have to also think through how many videos are you likely to release in a year? And this is an area that causes a lot of people fear. And some agencies release very few. Um, in the case of Fort Lauderdale, they went from 550 videos being released one year to almost 1,000 within two years. So they really had a significant increase in the number of videos that were requested. And because of Mercy's law, which is uh, deals with victims, they uh, spent an enormous amount of time doing redaction. And, you know, that can go from just one day to weeks of, of redaction as they're working through the different videos. And, you know, in the, in the case of, you know, some departments, they have officers or they have, you know, retired officers working on this. So they're having to learn advanced software systems to figure out how to do this redaction because 
Although the vendors say all oh, this redaction works, <laughs> when you really get there, everybody's finding out it doesn't exactly work like you need it to work. So redaction is a huge issue with the public release. Um, and, and you could end up with you know a lot of videos to be released. They um, had a public protest and they had a 500 videos that they had to redact in a very short order to do the public release on. They have found though that releasing the video caused an interesting relationship with their community. And that is that the community also had videos and they wanted to give them their videos from their ring cameras, from their, you know, their store cameras and everything. And so Fort Lauderdale really worked to figure out how to ingest the videos from the public. And so they set up a system uh, using their vendor to, to um, receive videos from the public. And they, this was all wonderful. And, and they got about mm, over 13,000 requests to submit videos within like a couple of years where people wanted to give them their video. And this, this worked out very well. Um, I continue, they, they have a group that meets regularly and we continue to participate in this. And one of the issues that came up is then you have to deal with how are you gonna publicly release videos that were submitted by citizens? Because in some cases, you know, that depending on the vantage point of where that video was taken from and everything, there's just sensitivities with respect to, to the release of those videos as well. So public releases is a, is a thorny issue to really think through all of the avenues, so. Um, we can talk about transferring footage, and, and this is, uh, the prosecutor's office had a big issue with that in terms of how they were going to receive this evidence. You know, they had some people coming by with couriers dropping off packages of CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays, and they had to figure out how to get all the appropriate equipment to read the different ways they were receiving the video. And, you know, and how to manage, they had to set up their own, their own office just to receive and just review and reformat videos so that their prosecutors could access those videos. And that was a pretty intense effort. The other side of that was how do you get this video to the de public defenders and, and the, in the, during the timeframes that are mandated and in what format are you going to give it out in? And what format are they requesting? And how do you how do you get some standardization going on there? And then finally, you know, the 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 last area is the courts. And you know, I think the courts are always um, unfortunately they're where the decisions are made, but technologically they're often behind. And so the, you know, in, in Broward County, it's a pretty large jurisdiction, but they're still burning CD, CD, CDs to give them to the court. And, and so even though they've managed to modernize a whole, a, a lot of the process between all the different agencies, because they have a very strong collaboration, you know, they still struggle with how to make that work for the court. They, they receive about 697 videos a day, and they're trying to process all those videos. The one thing that they found with the videos, though, is that they are getting a lot more pleas. And this is uh, helping them, but also the review time that the prosecutors are having to put in for the video is is, is a cost that they did not expect. So, you know, that, that those are all issues that slow downhill when we think about how digital evidence moves across the chain. So I hope, um, you know, if you have questions, we certainly are open to answer them. Um, we have our contact information on the next slide. And I don't know if Chuck and, and Craig want to add anything to. If you want to contact us, individually, please feel free to do so. We're happy to respond and answer any questions that you may have. Chuck? No, I don't have anything to add. I just really appreciate everybody's time and we look forward to any questions you might have here as well. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Allie Land at CNA. Allie? Thank you, Dr. Uchida, um, Dr. Solomon and Dr. Katz um, for these thoughtful remarks and to all of our attendees for joining us. Um, we did receive one question in the chat um, that I'll first direct to you, Dr. Yuchida, but also please chime in Dr. Solomon and Dr. Katz as well. And so the question that we received, um, how well are agencies integrating body-worn camera data with other types of digital evidence? Are there any good or best practices that we can learn from? Okay, that, 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 that's a tricky one, but I think one of the things that um, Chuck and I have been working on is actually looking at the, the metadata and how agencies are using body-worn camera platforms to integrate data and, and join data. What we're seeing within the metadata itself is that agencies are putting investigative, investigative information 
onto a platform. How systematically they do it is another question, though. Um, it's not clear that agencies are, are actually that aware of the ability to do that and, and to add other evidence to the platforms that are available. Chuck, I, uh, I'll turn to you for that because you've looked at Phoenix quite a bit and have a lot more nuanced information about how that works there. Yeah, I, I mean, I really think uh, there's a lot of opportunity with metadata and its use for understanding issues that are confronting officers, how officers are spending their time, um, as well as, uh, believe it or not, for other programs and policies within the, the organization itself. Uh, I mean, I think we could go on for quite a bit about this. Uh, I think that, that the metadata has some real strength, especially for smaller and medium-sized communities that do not have CAD RMS programs, which can be very expensive, very expensive. Uh, and metadata offers an opportunity to not only understand the, the number and types of activities that your officers are encountering in a shift, but also how much time they take on it. One of the things that we learned in Phoenix, quite interestingly, uh, was the how officers that were involved in proactive units were spending their time. CAD RMS data traditionally has done a very poor job of, of understanding what goes on outside of patrol, uh, how often those officers are engaged in different types of activities, how much time they're spending on it. And, and the metadata is proving exceptionally helpful in understanding what, what these officers are up to, how they're doing it. And it sheds light on something that so far we don't know a lot about. They're oftentimes operating on their own and we don't have an idea of, of what they're up to. The other one that we have learned that, that, that is somewhat interesting is the amount of different time that officers spend on a theme at scene and how it varies dramatically between CAD RMS data and uh, metadata. Metadata suggests that officers are spending much less time on an incident versus CAD RMS data. Uh, but the last thing that I would like to note is that metadata appears to be pretty helpful when it's combined with CAD RMS data in understanding activation rates. And this metadata is being used within early warning systems to give agencies an idea of which officers might be most at risk for uh, potentially problematic behavior in the future. So when an officer does not activate their camera, uh, it will show up in an EIS system. Benchmark, uh, a corporation yeah. that specializes in EIS, is using this in all of its algorithms, and it's providing, uh, proving useful. Seattle is now using it. Phoenix is considered using it. Is an idea of where problems might might peek their head. Okay. I, I just would would add that you know when we work with the prosecutor's office in uh, in, in, in Broward County, they would they they indicate this to to us when they get a file. That they have around seven to eight hundred files of evidence that are transferred for one case. So they had about one hundred and ten thousand files, and their evidence associated evidence digital evidence files associated with those cases was one point four million files. So that gives you a sense of how many pieces of digital evidence are going with each case. Thank you all. Thank you for answering um, that question as well. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.